Thank you. And thank you, everybody, for coming in uh, this evening. Uh, a renowned faculty member in the School of the Arts and Architecture, Kathy Opie, one of the world's great photographers and not just great teachers of photography, has said many times a simple point, ideas always start with questions. That is the frame and the format for the next 10 weeks in this course. Uh, if you'll allow me to take a few minutes, I'd like, as this is our first session, to briefly introduce the course. Um, and then I'll turn to a short introduction of tonight's session and question and introduce each of our uh, terrific guests here on the stage this evening. I'm Brett Steele, Dean of the UCLA School of the Arts and Architecture, and here tonight uh, very much as a faculty member and a member of a larger office that has done a huge amount of work in recent weeks to put together what I know is going to be a terrific uh, new kind of course here on campus. Uh, this quarter here at UCLA. Um, it's a course that's been designed with the input, uh, thinking, and advice of many people, not just up in my office, but across the entire school. And I'll thank them at the end of uh, this introduction. <coughs> uh, tonight's first session, uh, which I'll introduce, I've decided not in total tonight, and I, maybe it's because of several years' work as an editor and not only author of books, but I'd like to sprinkle an introduction across each of the 10 weeks for our students. One of the things I've learned as an editor is usually an introduction is best if it's written at the end of all of the hard work of putting the ideas and content and materials together. But I would like to offer two or three points to get this course going. And what I thought I would talk about very briefly is something of the form of this course its format, and for our students in attendance, a little bit about its weekly organization. And I promise you only a few highlights. So on the topic of form, um, this is a course that by design seeks to do one thing above all else, above all else, which is ask questions. Questions that are posed as a way to simply uh, open conversations about the ways in which important ideas and important questions posed from the vantage of the arts can be thought about and work can be done on through the lens, the life experiences, the professional um, experiences, the ideas that each of our guests will bring to that question from their own lives and careers. Um, for those of you um, up on the stage tonight, um, this is the first of a new experimental format that will bring together 40 terrific faculty members across the entire campus, not just the leafy north end of campus here that we in the arts love so much, for the purpose of a larger conversation around these ideas. One of its important um, ambitions, you could say, is in fact to create bridges of various kinds here on campus. Uh, it's not a bad intent, I think, at a time in which so many parts of the world talk about things like walls and borders in more ways than we can imagine uh, really are being struck up in new and unexpected ways. Those borders exist also in things like campuses in this day and age, where the wonderful, incredible work being done within schools too often operates in isolation of the many other interesting schools, forms of knowledge, and fields of experience that, that make up uh, the amazing city-state of, of a university like UCLA today. It's a community of about 80,000 people. Um, as you know, the smallest, I think most of you will know, geographically the smallest of the campuses in the UC system and owing to its population, for that reason also its densest. One of the things we would like to take advantage of is what that density might offer to bring us all together periodically in unexpected ways around, um, at times, unfamiliar questions that let us think about our own work in new, interesting, and unexpected ways. Um, regarding the form of this course, and as a minor concession to the history of art, there is a form of symmetry involved in how we've designed it. Uh, every one of these Tuesday evenings will feature two members of our faculty from the School of the Arts and Architecture and two members from the wider faculties across all of the other schools and research settings that will come together to talk about these questions. Yeah, that wasn't choreographed, but yes, there, there does seem to be clear lines drawn. We'll work on that. Um, 
I hope the conversation can do work on that symmetry going forward. Um, uh, Okay, so the second important bridge, just to mention very briefly, as this is our first session that we're looking at doing work on um, with the design of the course, is in fact two very different kinds of audience members here in a, in a terrific auditorium in Kaufman Hall. The, the first audience member here this evening is, of course, the students that have enrolled in this course formally and will be doing coursework and work, in fact, beyond these evenings every week over the next 10 weeks of this autumn quarter. Um, for those of you uh, students that have come in tonight, thank you, and thank you for taking time away from that part of the day, often directed towards things like dinner, cocktails with friends, Tuesday night <laughs> football, or whatever else fills one's life um, here on campus. In all seriousness, thank you for taking time and coming in for that. Um, for you to also be aware, the students enrolled in this course, interestingly, include not just students enrolled in one of the four faculties here in the school, which includes architecture and urban design, art, design, media, arts, world, arts, culture, dance. But in addition to those departments, departments in the two other schools of arts here at UCLA, theater, film, television, and music. So we get an opportunity to bring together students from those three different arts schools here uh, on campus and in fact from further afield as some of you students know already. Um, we have students tonight uh, here in the session that are enrolled uh, and studying right now in departments of neuroscience, biology, France, French, political science, many other departments including um, forms of knowledge further afield than arts regularly like financial actuarial mathematics. So thank you very much for coming in and being a part of this sort of audience. As a school, we take very seriously the idea, in fact, that a great school of the arts and architecture sees the making of audiences, the choreography of audiences, as an essential part of its work. And in fact, it's embedded in the history of this school from the moment it opened in venues like Royce Hall and others over the last century in which the bringing together of public audience is understood as a really essential part not just of our mission as a university, but of, of what a school like ours does in training individuals in various creative fields where that work is always best done in close proximity and regular interaction with audiences where ideas are formed and play out. Um, that's all about the form of this course. Regarding format, really just one point to remind you all, each week one big question has been posed. Um, that question will be approached, as I said earlier, from the different disciplines uh, and forms of expertise that will be up here on the stage every week. Um, my job will be, as my day job uh, involves regularly, a moderating and facilitating of the conversation that I hope to be able to keep going forward. Um, following on from each of the introductions that our guests will, will make at the beginning of this session, um, and finally, as I said earlier, about the organization of this course for you students. Um, as a larger group, you, of course, will meet in four smaller sessions, sections throughout the week. And in those sections, have an opportunity to literally rehearse and rework the kind of uh, conversation um, and discussion that will take place up on the stage starting off that week, with an idea that you will participate very much like like our guests that are up here on the stage. And that's really it about, as a few words about the larger course. As this is the first session of the, uh, of the quarter, if I could just take a couple of minutes of everybody's time to thank the big group of people that have really made this possible um, and who confirm for us the extent to which an event like this is simply one edge of a much larger space of activity and invention. Um, a terrific group of people have come together to help make this sort of course possible. In addition to you all as audience and our guest here tonight for taking the time of coming in, two vice provosts here at UCLA have been especially important in making this possible. Tim Brewer, um, our vice provost for interdisciplinary um, activities and cross-campus affairs has been very supportive in providing funding as has Roger Wakamoto, our vice provost for research, um, which has supported this for the for the, um, 
for his belief that in fact the work we do as artists, the designers, performers, is research of a different and important kind here on campus. Um, we have four brilliant TAs that our students here will all get to know well this term. Um, Jing Jing, Kyle, Haley, and Anna, thank you for taking time out of your studies to come together and be a part of this course. Um, from my office, Anne-Marie Burke, our Executive Director of Comms and Public Relations, has played a huge part in putting all of us together in the same space and time. Um, and in her office, Louise Kale and Kylie Kerrigan have, have done a really important part of expanding what will take place here on the stage in a larger online digital space that all of you students um, and the wider audience will have access to over the next 10 weeks. Jennifer Wells Green, our Executive Director of Development, has played a really important part of managing the big audience of people that want to come in uh, and be a part of this event. Um, and Victoria Marks especially, who is right in front of me with a phone reminding me it's time to finish this introduction, uh, and who is, in addition to being the Associate Dean of Academic Affairs here in the school, a brilliant choreographer and professor of her own right, and in fact the person who has choreographed this um, in such a tremendous way. Um, we have a couple of media partners, KCET and KCRW, um, who are a part of this event uh, in various ways in supporting our activities uh, and this bigger mission of taking this out to a public audience. And finally, uh, we have to thank um, our Department of World Arts, Culture, Dance for a huge amount of support in not just providing us a lovely room that I think we're gonna enjoy over the next couple of months, but providing all of the technical expertise that does things like turn the lights on and make these microphones work in magical ways. So everybody, thank you for coming in for this. I'm gonna now introduce briefly tonight's guests and tonight's first session. Thank you. <clears throat> and, and for that, let me try and do that from sitting down. Um, one of our ambitions was to take things like lecterns uh, and PowerPoint and other modern appliances away from a discussion of ideas uh, and forms of teaching and learning. So we're gonna try this sitting down. We'll work on our projection. Please tell us if we're struggling on that. Tonight's question, what is space? Uh, is the first of 10 questions that this course is gonna be organized around. Um, space is a concept, uh, a term and a word that particularly amongst fields like architecture have been important to signaling the very idea of a modern world. Um, and uh, it's not so much that space didn't exist before. Modern architects in the early 20th century claimed it. It's that there was a realization that construction of built space became a means for thinking about what the very idea of a modern subject might be in our world. Um, it's the only clue I'll give you that an architect has helped curate um, this series of questions. Uh, which we'll look at a number of different areas very quickly as we get through space um, this evening. Um, our guests tonight uh, are four really amazing uh, faculty members here at UCLA um, and who will help us um, literally launch what we hope is a multi-year effort to extend these kind of conversations from campus to Los Angeles to the West Coast to the United States and across the world in the coming years when we work through iterations of this kind of a format, and if, if you'll allow me, I'd just like to very briefly introduce each of our four guests who have agreed um, by means of a decision-making process I'm unfamiliar with, a running order for who <laughs> will speak first. Um, but let me just first introduce each of these four guests very briefly. Dana Cuff on my right here. Dana um, joins us this evening from the Department of Architecture and Urban Design uh, here in the School of the Arts and Architecture. Dana, Dana is a professor of Architecture and Urban Design here at UCLA, where she is also Director of City Lab, an award-winning think tank that advances experimental urbanism and architecture. Since receiving her PhD in architecture from Berkeley, Dana has published and lectured widely about spatial justice, the architectural profession, and affordable housing. She is the author of several books, including The Provisional City, about housing in Los Angeles, and based upon City Lab studies, Dana co-authored a landmark bill that permits backyard homes on virtually all eight million single family properties in California, enabling a doubling of built density of the suburbs across the entire state here in California. Uh, uh, 
Rodrigo Valenzuela joins us this evening from the School of the Arts and Architecture, where he is Assistant Professor of Photography in our Department of Art. Um, born in Chile and based in Los Angeles, Rodrigo is an artist working in photography, video, painting, and installation. His work constructs narrative scenes and stories that point to the tensions between the individuals and communities that inhabit uh, our cities and world. Uh, much of his work deals with the experience of undocumented immigrants and laborers. Rodrigo earned his MFA in Photomedia at the University of Washington, his BA in, the philosophy, in, the philosoph in philosophy from Evergreen State College, and a BFA in Art History and Photography from the University of Chile. Rodrigo's work has been exhibited extensively internationally, including recent shows in Vienna, the Ulrich Museum of Art in Wichita, the Fry Art Museum in Seattle, the Museo de Contemporaneo in Santiago, the Drawing Center in New York, and many, many others. Thank you. On my left and far left, Andrea Gez is Professor of Astronomy and Physics here uh, at UCLA. Andrea is a world-leading expert in observational astrophysics and has used the Keck telescopes to suggest the existence of a supermassive black hole at the center of our galaxy with a mass four million times that of the sun, which is four big. Four million? Really big. Very big. Um, <laughs> Andrea earned her BS in physics from MIT, her PhD from Caltech, and has been on faculty in the Department of Physics and Astronomy at UCLA since 1994. Andrea has actively disseminated her work and thinking to a wide variety of audiences through more than 100 refereed papers and 200 invited talks as well as features in textbooks, documentaries, and science exhibits. Her numerous honors and prizes include being the first woman to receive the Crayford Prize, a MacArthur Fellowship, and she has been elected to the National Academy of Sciences and the American Academy of Arts and Sciences. <laughs> and finally, um, tonight's, in, tonight includes Paul Weiss. Paul is a nanoscientist, a distinguished professor of material science and engineering, distinguished professor of chemistry and biochemistry, and a UC presidential chair. Paul's interdisciplinary research group includes chemists, physicists, biologists, material scientists, electrical and mechanical engineers, and computer scientists. Their work focuses on the atomic scale properties of surface and supramolecular assemblies, and I've been practicing supramolecular <laughs> in advance of this. Um, Paul received his SB and SM degrees in chemistry from MIT, his PhD in chemistry from the University of California at Berkeley. He was a postdoctoral member of the technical staff at Bell Labs, uh, a visiting scientist at IBM Almaden Research Center, before becoming director of the California Nanosystems Institute, professor of chemistry and biochemistry here at UCLA, and Fred Dobley, chair and nanosystems scientist. Uh, with his students, Paul has developed new techniques to expand the applicability of scanning probe microscopes and works to advance nanofab reaction to ever smaller scales and greater chemical specificity to connect, operate, and test molecular devices. <laughs> and Paul will be our first speaker tonight. To remind you all, we've, asked, we've organized this so that each of our guests will open the evening with a short presentation after which we'll have a conversation around some of the things presented. Great. Well, it's a fantastic honor to kick off this uh, series and the uh, first round. And I thought, uh, given the current times, we should start with uh, beer, politics, and oh, religion. Gosh. So uh, Joseph Priestley uh, really ushered in the modern era in chemistry, and he liked beer, too. <laughs> so he did something useful with it, though. He discovered and isolated carbon dioxide. And then he also invented soda water, which our hosts were kind enough to, uh, to bring me. Uh, he didn't commercialize it, though. Uh, uh, his contemporary, J.J. Schweck, <coughs> did and made a lot of money from it. So uh, really, at, the idea of atoms came from Democritus a couple of millennia earlier. But there were arguments over what made up matter us, everything around us. And by isolating and identifying individual molecules, Priestley was able to settle that dispute and usher in the idea of atoms making up molecules. 
shortly thereafter, that theory of chemistry developed. We were able to make new compounds. Uh, and in the thinking, and the reason I want to bring this up, the thinking at the time was about those component elements. And because we didn't have any way to visualize them, but we couldn't do much else either, we thought of atoms and the, and the things they, they, uh, they made. And that continued through the earliest, early 20th century and the quantum theory and understanding the orbitals of, of atoms and so forth. Uh, I should point out a few other things about Priestley. He was the founder of the Unitarian Church. He was, uh, uh, he considered a Benjamin Franklin a hero, but Benjamin Franklin also championed him. And when his house was burned down and he was uh, uh, in trouble in England, uh, Franklin helped arrange for him to come to America. And he spent the last years of his life uh, here. Okay, so this uh, pointer is about to die, by the way. Someone has new batteries. Yeah, so uh, I wanted to say something about uh, orbitals and space. So in what we do in nanoscience and in chemistry, we think about atoms. We don't think about the nuclei so much, except under special circumstances. Those are 100,000 times smaller and not usually relevant to uh, the work that we do in putting together the pieces and matter. There's some special cases where we can use them to advantage. If you look in a, ah, this is advancing rather. <laughs> Someone rearrange the buttons. What's that? It is on. Yes, see, you can, but it's advan you advanced it somehow. Okay, there we go. Back to here. So nuclei are small. Those have a positive charge. The electrons around them are what make up chemistry, uh, what we can visualize with the microscopes that we've developed. And they're the glue that holds molecules, materials, and all of us together. So up through the time that we understood these orbitals, everything was fine and we thought this way. But as we developed new techniques, as we made solids and looked at them, we kind of gave up the idea in our head that we could imagine those uh, individual atoms. And it wasn't until about the 1980s, there were, there were a few glimmers in the 50s and 60s, but really the 80s, the microscopes were developed that could image individual atoms by scanning a metal needle across the surface and really feeling the electrons of the uh, atoms on the surface. We're missing some, I think. Right? Oh, no, sorry. Right. This is, uh, some of you are old enough to remember manuals that had this page intentionally left blank. This is saying we lost the idea of, <laughs> of individual atoms and we thought about things in periodic structures and so forth. Forgot my own joke. That is not the end of the slideshow, though. Can you uh, fix the slides? There's another one right after that. OK, no problem. So this microscope was developed that let us image individual atoms. And we were excited that you know, all of a sudden, this nanoscale world opened up to us. And it really changed our thinking back. Looks like you have something got hidden. No? OK. I can talk. So, <laughs> never stopped me before. So, <laughs> so not only uh, could we image individual atoms, but we could look at the orbitals uh, in a sense like, there we go. OK. This was hard to, hard to describe otherwise. So here's uh, different scales, <laughs> starting with, with uh, red blood cells. So we're at a few microns here. Uh, we can look at all these devices, go down to DNA at a couple of nanometers across, where it's, of course, made up of individual atoms. But when Watson and Crick took Rosalind Franklin's data right, and got the structure of the double helix of DNA, they didn't really get the positions of all the atoms. They didn't get the sequence of the DNA and so forth. That came later through some decades of technology. I'll point out a couple of, of uh, related pieces here. Right? A virus is, we were just talking about this in the, in the prelude, is uh, made up of atoms. It's a precise structure that nature builds from the bottom up. Okay? Uh, my wife is a neuroscientist. She pointed out that the brain has always been nano, that <laughs> technology and scientists have 
are just millions of years behind, and our technology and making semiconductor devices has just now reached that same scale. And so a project that we have together is to try and understand what a thought is and what a memory is by trying to listen in on the communication between cells in the brain, listen in to the hundred different chemicals that are used for signaling. Now, in nature, these structures are built from the bottom up. Chemistry, assembly, these are super both examples of supramolecular assemblies. In most of what humans do, uh, we use top-down, or essentially direct descendants of wood and stone carving that we've done for centuries. Bill Murray got to be pretty good at ice sculpting in the end of Groundhog Day. But uh, you know, one, of the, one of the strategies we use now is to say, can we make precise or functional structures from the bottom up? Can we make bigger and bigger precise or sufficiently precise structures to understand and control their properties, or for instance, to interact with the brain? The scale of biology is the nanoscale, and so we have this opportunity to develop these interactions. Okay, now, a little bit about about how important space is. So carbon monoxide, the poison, right, was also isolated by Priestley. He didn't know it, but he did know that it was poisonous. Uh, he uh, got CO2. In a steel mill, you may know that the last reaction that produces energy is taking carbon monoxide to, oh, the, your, yeah. OK, this didn't transfer correctly, but I'll tell you it's only in the third digit of precision that the spacing of the carbon and the oxygen atoms are different between carbon monoxide and carbon dioxide. And there's a tremendous energetic difference between those two. For those of you who take high school or uh, freshman chemistry, have a look at the difference between single, double, and triple bonds in carbon. Things like acetylene to ethylene to uh, ethane. Right? There are very tiny differences that are a factor of one, two, and three in terms of those bond strengths. So getting those separations right, whether we're understanding them or placing them, makes a very big difference. And that's all the chemistry we need to know for now. Okay. Now, we can image individual atoms. This was from the time I was at IBM. And this is a distorted image. So this is a single xenon atom, which turns out to be my favorite rare gas. Okay. You know, when you breathe helium, it makes your voice high. If you breathe xenon, it makes your voice low. It also has an anesthetic effect. So if you do this during, we're being recorded, that's okay. Uh, <laughs> if you do this during a freshman chemistry lecture, you have to pour it out of your lungs because it's too heavy to diffuse out, and you risk passing out. And so I always have TAs in the front ready to hold me upside down by my ankles to drain it out of me. It has kind of an anesthetic effect, too. So it's no good to lecture. You do it right at the end of the lecture. OK, back to xenon. So, uh, this isn't the size of a xenon atom that we know from other measurements. This is where the electrons are around the xenon atom. And so for the physicist involved, this uh, seemed like something of a disappointment. I'll point out that each one of these very, very shallow protrusions is a nickel atom. And that's because the electrons that form the bonds between them smooth out so much. And we had to blow up this scale just to make the figure interesting where there's much more we can do with these microscopes, it turned out. So I chose this particular image because, to me, it's the most important one ever recorded. So it has two different atoms, gallium and arsenic. You don't have to know anything about them other than that arsenic likes electrons more than gallium. And so all the electrons that are involved in bonding sit on the arsenic, and all the orbitals on the gallium are empty. And so with this microscope, we can send electrons into the empty orbitals and take them out in two different measurements uh, yeah, uh, of the filled orbitals, and really look at where the electrons are and where they aren't, kind of like no theater. And that turns out to be just the way an atom or molecule cruising along the surface would see that surface. And it lets us explore and understand the chemistry with better than atomic resolution, as if we could put on goggles right, that show us the chemistry of a surface. So that led to many, many other capabilities. Uh, one of the things I did when I was at IBM was we, I wanted to find out what was underneath those atoms, so I rewrote the software in a microscope to slide them out of the way. And I didn't spell anything. That came after I left. 
Uh, but that let us position atoms and form these precise structures, like this famous quantum corral image, where I'll point out all these waves are not extra atoms. They're just the electrons interfering with each other, as if we threw a rock in a compound. And so we now understand the chemistry that results from having those extra electrons right in the middle there. There will be a molecule that would want to sit at that one particular point, not because of any special chemistry of what's underneath. Everything is the same. It's all copper. But we changed the chemistry there by these uh, manipulations. We can play a Newton's Cradle game, too. That's another story. There should be one more. OK. Uh, we have a lot to learn from each other. So just as Muybridge, right, 130 years ago, took these stop frame images of a horse to prove that all four hooves left the ground at any given time, in what Professor Gez does and what I do, we get glimpses of what we're looking at. And how we interpret what happens in between is all important to our understanding. And so one of the great benefits of being at a place like this is I could work with a filmmaker and go through what are the rules of animation, which Disney put together in a Bible some years ago, so we could understand what the possibilities were, both in how atoms and molecules move across the surface, but also so that how we could understand it in our own heads, how we would display it to control, modify, inform our perception. Okay? And so I think part of this community that we have is really uh, an opportunity for us to uh, learn from each other and share. And thank you so much for including me in this uh, wonderful event. Thanks. Thanks, Paul. Thank you. Rodrigo. Uh, I just want to play a video first, and then I'm going to talk. Can you dim the lights down, please? Otras personas no se tienen que acordar de olvidarse. Revisar sus bolsillos es todo lo que tienen que traer. Plata, llaves, identificación. Es su estrategia para presentarse. Cualquier estrategia. La mía es mirar a todos, a todos, a todos, directamente. Sin disculparse por ser un monumento de un destino azaroso. Como esperemos que muestre mi cara y oculte mi identidad. La película empezó sin mí y alrededor de mí. No entiendo la oscuridad de la imagen ni me veo en la reflexión de la pantalla. Si estoy fuera de foco o fuera de cámara, tengo que seguir la conversación. Mantener las balas visibles cerca de mí, pero no en los bolsillos, nunca en los bolsillos. Se me olvidó que me traje, que siempre me acuerdo de olvidar que este lugar solo intercepta mi discurso. Le hace uso, pero no parte. Pensé que podía ser útil, que alguien podría utilizarme. ¿Qué pasa si cada vez que cambio de posición, mi cuerpo, mis pies, mi cabeza, mis manos? Si ese lugar nunca es acá. Acá no existe para mí, para ti y para usted. Estoy al borde y adentro, pero nunca ahí. ¿Cuántos hay? ¿Uno? Uno es mucho. Lo peor sería que prendiera las luces y todo está bien. Porque todo está en el mismo lugar. ¿Qué pasa cuando nada pasa? ¿Qué le hago a ello? ¿Y ello qué está haciendo? Yo dibujo el mundo redondo desde afuera. Desde dentro es una ficción politizada. No hay orientación casual o momento singular donde mi presencia sea habitual. La diferencia es que unos pueden hacer pasar cosas y a mí las cosas me pasan. Pero no me puedo emancipar de esta pieza, de las cosas. El mundo me intercepta con preguntas. Cada vez me transforma en un objeto que tiene que ser puesto en el lugar correcto, en un lugar pequeño de su imaginación. En esta pieza todo está a su lugar, y yo, adyacente y distante a la vez, en cada posición. Mi cuerpo está determinado por la asociación con otros, como si fuéramos hermanos, sobrinos, primos que producen nada familiar. Nos extrañamos más con cada conexión, solo el heredero de una apariencia y una presencia que disuelve con nuestras similitudes. Compartimos una experiencia común, pero las partes, solo las partes. Me alineo con mi rutina, la que me recuerda que tengo que olvidar. ¿Qué estaba pasando cuando yo entro a un lugar? Yo. Yo no estaba pasando. La conversación sigue en el espacio público, pero no en el colectivo. Me acomodo aún acá. Allá, soy una acumulación de gestos de ansiedad social. La palabra que ocupo para definirme será las herramientas de resistencia. Las palabras que no ocupo soy el lugar que habito. Pero ¿qué va a pasar cuando me canse de construir las condiciones donde me voy después de escuchar y la presencia entendida? ¿A dónde voy después si la pregunta cada vez es dónde vengo? Incluso si puedo apuntar, la insistencia de dónde vengo, vengo, cae como ladrillos. Ladrillos para construir una pared que me deja fuera en cada momento e identifica a otro como el portero. So I don't know if you get everybody to see the subtitles. So, um, uh, I was thinking a lot um, about the space. And I think some of the questions I sent uh, people is, uh, 
is the probably is the less romantic version of the conversation about the space that you can have is uh, when you have not enough space, right? It's like as a um, I think uh, in the arts and in, many in institutional spaces, as a person of color, you feel like there is enough space for one, but two becomes a lot. So it's like how can rooms can become oppressively small, even if they are really large in size, right? Um, how you find these spaces to become, like and translating any word that have like so much romantic charge into something more simple, more tangible, like saying room, right? They don't have enough room. It's something that you hear a lot. Like it's a space, um, it's almost half like, so I, I like to translate words into something very simple and very attainable. So I, I just wanna show you um, two examples of words I've been thinking about when somebody invite me to do something in a room because basically it's like, they invite you to fill up white walls when you make art, right? It's like, put stuff there, <laughs> any stuff. Like we need, we need this guy that makes work about something else. Uh, like you know that like, and so I. Well, so the lights are. Can you turn that light out? Can you just uh, put the lights? Um, I, people don't need to see me for this. But. <laughs> so, so thinking about the space, uh, I I enter museums where they. I feel my my job is trying to disrupt the 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 hegemony that like, uh, like European art have had over the, the course of like, you know, solid 600 years. <laughs> so like, you go to places where they tell you, you can have the whole museum to make work, to put the stuff. And then uh, like, and they're like, but you already have so many stuff. Can I just like use your stuff? And then it's my idea. So, uh, and which also relate, the, relate to the idea of like, what is the work made of, right? It's like, a lot of, I mean, I'm guilty of this, where I'm, I'm busy all the time and I don't have time to make new work and consider that moving your hands is only the form of labor that we appreciate, right? Like intellectual labor is really hard labor. And, and, and your ideas, and the only way that you can manifest your ideas filling up spaces with stuff is like by moving your hands a lot, right? So like you enter another conversation of economic placement where how much words are my ideas versus somebody else's ideas. Right, like what is this space? Um, what is the collection goes? Who owns those pieces? Which other space does this uh, inhabit, right? So in this museum they have like, I, I need to find the common denominator for the spaces to understand what I'm doing in this museum. In this case was at the um, Jordan Schnitzer Museum in Eugene, Oregon. And basically every, you know, we're lucky. We have a very prestigious institutions where we have the, um, the Hammer that have an amazing collection and some contemporary art. But in general, every university has their own museum and every small town have their museum. Like the only thing that they have in common is that like, they all have a terrible American uh, landscape paintings. Like they all have <laughs> the same thing. So like to me it was like how is like when European guys make a painting is sublime and, <laughs> and like Latinos make it is pictoric or like, you know, picturesque, right? It's, it's how, how we make access that space of like aspiration aspirational like philosophical concerns, right? How, how we can become that guy. Like, so in this case, like I, 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 I grabbed the walls from a past exhibition and I and access the permanent collection of the place and I, I conceal all the permanent collection of these paintings <laughs> in the space. So I grab all the work that they own and, 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 and if you remember a little bit of the script of the other, the, so the movie, how I made it, it's like I shot it with people and I didn't know what, what the work was really about. So I went into this like um, uh, stream of consciousness a speech where I was like talking to a Microsoft phone as I, as I watched the movie. And, um, and, and the movie is about this, uh, it's called Tertiary, which is like uh, the third characters in a movie, right? Secondary characters is the best friend, you know, maybe the guy that have one line, but the other people are the background actors, right? The, 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 the tertiary is like people that have like their, their job name, you know, cop one, you know, clerk one. And usually those people are the people of color, right? They like need to fill it up, fill up this, the movies with people of color so the, the scene look real, right? Um, 
but they have no talking parts. You know, so like in the in the way the movie and this piece is about that. It's about like I don't need to make a better landscape than that. I just need to put it in front. I just I just don't want. I, I don't need to be very, like there is plenty of mediocre dudes there. You know, can I be? Can I stalk a little? Can I stalk for a little bit? Can I go make a mediocre landscape? So it's like, but put it in front. Like don't like. So you have to see my work through the through the walls or through the through the other. So like it's a matter of priorities right now to me. Like so like it doesn't need to be better. You need to be presented first, in the same way you have placed the other guys first all the time, or like you have surrounded these spaces or the walls. You have fill it up. There is balls of stuff that they're like they make no sense. They have no meaning beside that. Like one guy wanted to paint a landscape, mm -hmm. and it was sublime under mm -hmm. like his you know experience. Um, so yeah, I went to Savrisky Point, I shot this. Uh, in another situation, I, I was like in this, where um, uh, it actually was my first museum show, Seattle, um, uh, the Friar Museum. They have this, uh, this beautiful Salon-style permanent uh, collection. It's fucking amazing room, it's beautiful. It's the museum, you know, that like you take your grandma and, like, you, and, and you have a lovely <laughs> afternoon. You know, look at the things, you know. They are naked, but they're not really sexual, right? They're like, they're like really, really beautiful. And like the walls are really nice. So basically when I have the show, you know, Seattle is changing a lot. There is uh, like all these like constructions and stuff. Um, so I decided like, well, there is a place that we go. There's a space that we try to get knowledge and it's always look the same. So what I did, just like, I just transformed the whole space. There is a room. I just left the scaffolding. I made graffiti on the, on the walls. And I, and I made these images, uh, the, this series of photos called hedonic, uh, hedonic Reversal, which is like searching pleasure for pain. That is, uh, that is, a, that is what it means, uh, uh, Hedonic Reversal. But, um, so I just, this is the same room, like where I left the work, the, the paper that they cover the floors to protect it. I just cover the whole place in, in graffiti. I let the scaffolding. Uh, and in some way, we're gonna go to spaces and we're gonna try to soak knowledge, but they're not all gonna look like these white cubes. They're not, they're not gonna be alienating for people that haven't historically belonged to these white cubes. So I just wanna be able to like go to places and soak up knowledge the, the independently of how they look. Um, so yeah, that is the exhibition where I, that, that is two samples, and, and that is the C, you know, where again, I'm, I shoot photos, and I shoot in my studio, I don't have a big studio, so I shoot and reshoot, so, which is a different conversation about space where like the idea of space happen in the photographic realm where things are like um, the photo have a time that imply in the time that you spend with the other photo that you re-photograph later. So you allow yourself to like kind of improve on the work that you did uh, without changing space, but still there is a psychological space that you enter when you look at these images because you know that time passed, you just don't know when. So like, uh, those are kind of the two samples of the work that kind of follow the line of that video and the way that I understand a space as seen as a, um, as a place that we need to fix and like not consider that it's like a given, you know, like for you, but like when I enter a space, I see how many Latinos there are, how many black people there are, and then it's like, and sometimes it's just not enough, and sometimes it's just too many, and like who dictate those places? Uh, it is a lot of the power of the institutions, and those are the things that we'll, we need to like keep accountable and control and, and remind them of their power, the way that they control knowledge, right? So it's important to like for me to like evidence that with this project. Uh, but yeah, that's it. Terrific. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Very much. Thank you. Dana. Here I go. Uh, maybe. <laughs> Let's see. It's this one. Okay. Yeah. All right. So I'm going to just stand up because my neck is getting a crank from looking behind me. Um, architecture space. In 10 minutes, it's going to be about 700 years. So that gives me about 1.3 minutes per century. So it's going to be fast. <laughs> um, and I have a little argument. So that complicates my 10 minutes. And that is that uh, there is no such thing as architectural space, except for as we think about it historically. And so I want to take you from the modern subject or modern space, which is a really 20th century idea, to contemporary space in Los Angeles. 
And I would say that that's the movement through space as abstraction, that's the modern era, uh, that that goes into a post-war space of transformation, and that we're currently in a, a period in which we can think of space productively as reclamation. What do I point at? Okay. So in order to do that, I have to give you a slight prehistory because the space of abstraction doesn't mean much unless you think about where it came from, which was really the Renaissance idea of space. And it's Brunelleschi who either discovers or rediscovers the idea of perspective. And in that, it turns out that, of course, space is a kind of mathematics and that we can actually develop a science of space through the process of its representation and that the construction of three dimensions into two dimensions, which you see so beautifully rendered in this etching, actually helps in the construction of particularly spectacular and innovation, innovative buildings like the Duomo in Florence that Brunelleschi himself made. And during this period, um, this, the, the Siegfried Gideon, who wrote the book Space, Time, and Architecture in 1941, says that the ultimate example of uh, Renaissance and perspectival space is really the city of Paris with Haussmann and Napoleon III's help. And you see in this before and after image how the city becomes a kind of outdoor room, a kind of space that you would say is the city of form according to the architect and urbanist Albert Pope. And you can think about that city of form as being almost an excavation through the mass of buildings out of which streets or piazzas or plazas are made. And so the city is almost a thick mat in which space can be discovered or excavated. And in this uh, reconstruction, I think it's important to note, we often think of Haussmann and Paris as being its boulevards, but what makes the boulevard is Haussmann's housing blocks, the apartment blocks that he made that became the urban filler in a way to lead you to the perspectival um, object of your affection at the end of the vista or at the end of the one point perspective. The other thing that's I think worth noticing in this is that it brings the subject into the view because we have a single point of view. We have a, we have a location in the perspectival Renaissance city. You see this best standing right in the middle of the Champs-Élysées. All right. Uh, oops, wrong direction. We need to get up in history. Uh, Okay, so here we are in modern space. I think uh, the contrast between, say, what Haussmann and Paris and Brunelleschi were making and this Bauhaus image from the painter, actually, Oskar Schlemmer, situates the figure as a kind of abstract entity in an abstract space that extends forever in every direction outward from him, I think. Um, and so that figure seems to be both central and dislocated somehow in this uh, space that is in fact the focus as a form of abstraction. I feel like, hmm, this is unlikely to run. Can you make that video run? Ah, perfect. So here's the way Oscar Schlemmer made that into a dance. Um, by showing that, in fact, this is called a pole dance. You can imagine what else I found on the internet while I was looking for this. Um, the, um, the figure is really erased in order to become the vehicle to demonstrate abstract space. And this kind of beautiful demonstration of the way space itself might look is what Schlemmer was trying to achieve. Can we go forward? Yes, before the pole dance ads come up after. Um, so really, the master of modern architecture, as anyone in the room who's an architecture student would know, is Le Corbusier, who writes in a book called The, modern, the Making of Modern Space. Let me make sure I have that title correct. He writes, a boundless depth opens up 
It faces the walls, drives away contingent presences, accomplishes the miracle of ineffable space. And I think even in that language, Corb was a beautiful writer as well as architect, um, he portrays this notion of a, an abstraction that the architect then was there to try to capture um, as this almost existential ineffable um, task, which the Ozonpont studio, I think, is a perfect example of. Uh, this is in the book, The New World of Space. But Corb thought that the major arts, which he defined as architecture, sculpture, city planning, and painting or drawing, um, were in fact all united and major because they were all about space. And so you see in his Ville Radieuse, the city itself is a plane of space out of which architecture is situated. The Villa Savoie, which is the er example of spatial manipulation by the architect that he's freed the ground plane by raising it up on uh, columns or piloti, that he's freed the facade by separating it from the structure, and that he's freed the barrier between inside and outside through the strip window that distributes light evenly throughout. And that same freedom he captures in that drawing, which is left open, and though a boundary is not at all bounded. So if you think about modern space as being the space of the city, and now I'm going to leap from the building to the city, um, Los Angeles itself is part of the object of modernist urban spatial thinking. And Bunker Hill is probably our best example of that, which in fact uh, in the 50s and 60s and 70s was flattened and cleared, turned into a tabula rasa or clean slate, so that the new modern abstract space could be built upon it. This is just one plan of many, many plans that were made that would bring Los Angeles into the modern era um, through its architectural composition. It's important to note even here, though, that the freeways are part of what is constructing that space of the city. And probably the person who brought that to our minds most clearly was the British architectural historian Rainer Banham, who wrote the book, Los Angeles, Architecture of Four Ecologies. And he thought that the freeways, of course, he's writing in the late 60s, publishes in the 70s, when you could actually get from one place to another on the freeway, um, <laughs> that he writes that that's its whole, uh, whole space of existence. The freeway system, in its totality, is now a single, comprehensible place, a coherent state of mind, a complete way of life, the fourth ecology of the Angelino. And I bolden the place, because it's the way we have distinguished in um, most recent history space from place, that somehow space is something that exists and can be passed through or extends <coughs> abstractly from us, while place is a site of dwelling. And he was making the point that, in fact, the freeways were a site of dwelling. What he didn't acknowledge is that the freeways wiped out dwellings everywhere they went, and that that was their national task. And in fact, we can see that the Boyle Heights neighborhood has been particularly victimized, both by the East LA interchange, but also by the 101, as a means of eradicating poor neighborhoods of color. And so the politics of space really starts to play into this next era of both uh, transformation and of what we'll later call um, reclamation. You see up in the upper right the neighborhood of Boyle Heights that sits under and next to the um, 101 freeway. And this you can see in one short year hmm. is, in fact, the transformation into a new and modern housing development designed by the son of Frank Lloyd Wright and some of his colleagues. Uh, this is public housing. All public housing also had to be located one for one elimination on top of uh, what were deemed slums, which was a political determination. Um, always disadvantaging neighborhoods of color. Oops. And so now, with that hard history behind us, how do we move forward in the city 
of like Los Angeles, which if Paris was a city of form, what Albert Pope has suggested, and I think we've seen in the other images, Los Angeles is a city of space. We basically live on a field condition, a, a plane in which sprawl has been the space of our uh, transformation and production. And now, finally, after decades of asking for this as an urbanist and architect, we're building back in. And what we're having to do is reclaim space that has otherwise seemed not available to us. And I'm here just gonna show you one project that Brett alluded to in his introduction, and that's this space of the backyard home or the secondary unit, which is a project that City Lab, my center, has been working on for a dozen years. So if LA can double the density of its single family neighborhoods by adding backyard homes, it will become a model of a post-suburban city transformed through discovered space for affordable housing with no public funding. Given the nature of our housing crisis, the uh, reclaiming of lost space for uh, our residents is an absolutely critical task for the architect. Can you change? Oh, perfect. Uh, so what we see is that there is this kind of found space that was in backyards that can grow steadily over time, that can do that without changing neighborhoods, and that there's an increment, a, a molecule of urbanism, if my colleagues will allow me, that's something like the small house, which itself is a didactic transformation or adaptation of the two-car garage that we would in fact decide to house people better than cars. And so that little house that we built on the campus uh, is exactly that same footprint and is intended to be a reclaimed space for occupancy. Oops. And like the stacking in nanoscience, I'm trying to make some connections that'll maybe bring us together in our conversation. Oops, we went one too far. Um, those small increments actually add up to huge change. If there are 8 million single family houses in California, this is the most radical transformation of our landscape, of the space of our state that's happened since World War II. Um, there are many, many other spaces to be reclaimed and found, whether it's surface parking or underutilized uh, school campuses where it's still, again, we can uh, repurpose that space and reclaim it for making our city a better place to live for all of our residents. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you, Dana. Oh. And Via? Okay. Passing it a bit. If, if you touch it just <laughs> the forward and back, it seems to work. I think I was pressing the wrong button all okay. the time. Great. Uh, well, you, if you ask an astrophysicist what space is, <laughs> um, I'm going to tell you three things. <laughs> it's really big, <laughs> it's very humbling, and it's connected to time. So those are the three things I hope to share with you. It's also, um, in astronomy, uh, it's actually, astronomy is one of the oldest uh, sciences because we have an amazing ability to study space. Um, with just your eye, which of course is one of our, gives us one of our five senses, we can see well beyond the boundaries of our own galaxy to the next closest galaxy. And if you compare that to any of our other senses, that's rather astounding how far we can uh, smell, how far we can taste, how far we can hear. But our ability of sight really brings space that's very large um, to us. Now, um, so was, people have been studying astronomy for a very long time. Uh, but today, the study of astronomical spaces is carried out with very large telescopes. So I have to share with you one of the wonderful aspects of being at UCLA is that UC owns the largest telescopes in the world. These are co-owned by UC and Caltech. They're not in a bad space here on Earth. They're out in Hawaii. So um, most of the folks here at UCLA carry out their work um, uh, with these telescopes. 
So it used to be that we had to go up to the summit, but in fact now you can control these facilities here from um, UCLA. Now telescopes allow us to see uh, very far. The bigger the telescope, the larger the collecting area. So you can see um, uh, things that are faint. And in astronomy, faint corresponds to things that are far away. So that's one aspect of distance. Another aspect of distance, because space we usually think of as three dimensions, but of course if you're a physicist you might think, well maybe not, maybe it's 9, 10, or 11, and we can deb debate about that, but we're going to today stick to three dimensions of space and one dimension of time. So my thinking about space is four dimensional. So we have distance, um, which is our distance away from us, and then in the plane of the sky, what we see out in the universe, there's two dimensions of space, and then of course there's time, so we're going to come back to time. Now, this is the humbling part. <laughs> uh, used to be, we thought we were the center here on Earth. We thought space surrounded us, and then we were at the epicenter of space. But of course, with Galileo, Galileo, who was uh, committed to house arrest for this radical notion that we were not at the center of everything, we now recognize that the Earth is just one of uh, many planets that orbit a sun which in fact is quite ordinary. So in fact we had a phase where we thought the sun was special, but now we realize not even the sun that we orbit is special. Our galaxy is composed of roughly 100 billion stars like the sun. The sun you can think of as a middle-aged star, just getting ready to get out, go out and get that red sports car. It's five <laughs> billion years old, it's halfway through its lifetime, which is also another humbling thought in terms of space. Our sun, when it runs out of gas, and it will in another five billion years, is going to expand. So we live in a dynamic universe, and it will expand to envelop the Earth. So if you ever forget what um, order the planets come in, just remember the TV show, Third Rock from the Sun, or Third Rock, because uh, we are the third rock from the sun. Uh, uh, so at some point, the sun will actually envelop us, which actually I think really drives us to think about exploring space. Can we get off this rock and go further? Um, because there will be a moment if we uh, manage to survive where we will need to explore the larger universe um, uh, by moving. All right, so in our universe, we not only, we have the sun, and we said that there's, uh, the sun is pretty typical, and now we have the ability to recognize that um, this, uh, while the, the, the stage that the sun is in is, is pretty boring, actually it's pretty static, uh, fortunately for us, but there are some really interesting and dynamic parts of, its, of, of a star's life. Just like a human's life, the most exciting t uh, parts tend to be the beginning and the end. So in the beginning, this is a picture that shows the beginning of stars' lives. And if you, if you go further with this uh, analogy with a human lifetime, uh, the birth of a star compared to um, the age of a typical star's life is like a human gestation period. So uh, on, star, on a star's time scales, this is a, million, a few million years uh, of time passes as the star goes through the process of collapsing from enormous scales down to the size of our sun and our solar system. So that is the beginning. Now, uh, just like uh, humans, the end is also ex uh, exciting. So we already alluded to the end of the, Earth, of the sun, but in fact, our sun is a, a fairly small star, and it, and it, and it, it ends its life, uh, well, while we say it's gonna be dramatic because it's gonna envelop the Earth, uh, in an astronomical sense, it's actually rather non-dramatic. The mass of stars um, are the ones that explode. So this is a picture of an exploding star. Um, so we have a dynamic user nervous again because we go from um, things at the beginning that are shrinking to at the end where things are expanding and expanding quite explosively. And in, these, in this explosion, it's actually where we get the chemical complexity that we so appreciate here on Earth. Our universe starts off with incredibly, uh, incredible simplicity. It's just hydrogen. And out of the inner workings of stars, we can um, build up to more chemical complexity, um, up to iron. But in fact, iron is a pretty simple um, atom. And it's only in these exploding massive stars that we get all the complexity that we so appreciate here, like gold or anything that your cell phones are uh, created uh, from, uh, are created in these explosions of uh, massive stars. Now we've gone from a point where we said the Earth was the middle to the Sun that was the middle. And then a mere hundred years ago, and to me this is rather amazing, a hundred years ago, 
we thought our own galaxy was it. And today, we recognize that our galaxy, and if we could get outside our own galaxy and look back, this is what our galaxy would look like. We live about halfway out. Um, it's just one of many, 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 billions and billions of, of galaxies, <laughs> as uh, uh, many others have said. So the galaxy that I was just showing you a moment ago is the one in the top, um, top left. So today, we understand that, in fact, there's a universe um, that's on a much, much larger scale. So in the last uh, mere hundred years of our history, we've, we've come to understand the vastness of the universe. Now, <laughs> um, we collect this information primarily through telescopes. We're collecting light. Or, um, or photons, which are little light packets. And it turns out that these light packets, these carriers of information, do not travel at infinite speed, but they travel at the speed of light, which we actually think of as the cosmic uh, speed limit. Nothing can go faster in our universe than the speed of light. But this means that as we study the universe, we're not seeing it as um, it is today, but rather as it is when that photon that you're collecting um, was emitted from it. And because we are now studying scales that are so big, what we're really getting is a history lesson. And to give you a sense of this, so I study the center of the galaxy. That's my favorite place in the universe to look at. The light from the center of the galaxy takes 26,000 years to get from the center of the galaxy um, to our telescopes. So I have to say, I'm very excited about an, an, an event that's happening this, uh, just culminating now over the last six months. But that six months happened 26,000 years ago. Okay, so that's already um, mind blowing to me, but you know, that's nothing in astrophysics. So once we get uh, going to the next closest galaxy, we're talking two million years ago. That's the light that we're co um, collecting. And when we talk about the edge, the edge of the universe that we can see today, we're looking back 14 billion years ago. So in fact, we're not seeing these, these places in space as they are today, but as they were so long ago. So that's one way in which space is highly connected to time. Now there's another way in which space is connected to time. And that's if you get near objects that have large gravitational fields. So my favorite objects in the universe to study are black holes. Turns out there's a supermassive black hole at the center of the galaxy, four million <laughs> times the mass of the sun, crammed into a space the size of our solar system. So lots of mass, small space, that's, what, uh, that's the proof of a black hole. But why do we care about it in the context of this discussion? We care about it in the context of this discussion because when you get near black holes or any object that has a gravitational field, you get this mixing of space and time. So if you go to any science museum, there's the classic gravi uh, gravity well, uh, and that's supposed to represent the concept of two dimensions of space being mixed, they flatten out one dimension of space, with one dimension of time. So if you were to send your buddy, or maybe not so much your buddy, into the black hole, <laughs> uh, you would see your buddy um, um, get, uh, get slower and slower and then pause at a magic distance from the black hole known as the event horizon. They just stop. And that's because it's very hard for the photon that's the carrier of information to make it from them to us. It's the mixing of space time. Your buddy, Ex uh, uh, his experience or her experience would be to get faster and faster and go right through the event horizon. So that is an aspect of space that I find uh, particularly fascinating. And um, I'm just going to uh, skip over these things uh, uh, just to share that um, our ability to study space and time is advanced by having larger and larger telescopes. So UC has had the largest telescope in the world for 100 years. The Keck telescope is just the latest and greatest. Uh, it's been around for 25 years, but we're in the middle of building um, an even bigger telescope. It is a 30-meter telescope, um, which, is now, uh, which we also hope to build, uh, which we hope will be built uh, in Hawaii. Um, and it's a collaboration between the University of California, Caltech, Canada, 
Japan, China, and India. So that brings us into other connections of space uh, and connectivity in the world that brings us back down to a human scale. So thank you very much. Thank you, thank you Andrea. Um, indeed, thank you, thank you, all four of you. As an audience member, that was just awesome. <laughs> really fantastic. I don't know, I, I, I arrived a little late and I can't remember how the order was sorted, but let me just say there was some inspiration in this idea of going from the molecular <laughs> to the room or gallery to the city and to the galaxy. So our work is done. We have covered the spectrum. That's really interesting. And, and of course, that, that would beg follow-on questions immediately about, about the, the um, negotiating role of an idea of scale or size in relation to a concept like space that I think each of your talks touches on really interestingly. But to, to throw an immediate question out for, for each of you, um, and maybe in response, so that you could respond to, to other things heard on the stage, um, I'm struck by the way in which each of you touched on, uh, on the importance of a particular kind of tool from which you then spoke about space. So in some cases, a kind of technology, a microscope, a telescope, um, a tool in the sense of an institution or a museum as being a, a vital idea of site that then a project reacts to. And, and in, case, in the case of the city, Dana, the, the notion of a map or a geography described through various representational mm -hmm. conventions. Mm -hmm. Could you say something about, about your, your daily lives and routines around the way in which the tools that are clearly a part of your lives help you think about the work that you're doing? Or does all that sort of sit on the side as we just sit in a world of ideas and concepts? Well, I can't think without uh, representational tools, period. I mean, I have to have diagrams that both mm. reduce the kinds of information that is spurious and competing and that takes the scale of whatever it is that I'm looking at and synthesizes, so mapping has turned out to be, a, if you think of mapping broadly, and the process of mapping has turned out to be a really fundamental part of my work now. Uh, I, I mean, it seems to me that, Andrea, yours is like, you have to have the biggest tool, besides. I mean, you, this must be like a political act, so my hmm. command of the tool is also in my, mostly in my power. But in your case, it would seem like it's absolutely outside your uh, power. We have a very collaborative space yeah. <laughs> huh. uh, in working with these uh, very large telescopes because they're, it's, a, it's a huge investment, so you have to yeah. sh um, share that, um, that tool. The, 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 another connection, though, is our, our desire to map. So we are definitely making maps, and our ability to visualize um, the information or the space really affects your ability to, to, um, to understand it. Um, so uh, an animation that I skipped was our ability to, um, to map out these orbits that are in three dimensions um, and see them from different perspectives. Because of course in two dimensions you have a very different understanding about the space between objects, which is enormous, but seems to, uh, they seem to overlap when you only look at it in projection. Oh. Yeah. Most of our time is spent building or fixing tools. Uh, it's the, you know, the feast at the end of preparing, you know, massively for that uh, time when you can record data or develop a new capability that, you know, you get to see from the outside. But, you know, for instance, there's a microscope we've been trying to make work for 29 years now, and we're getting closer. But the student who, who was working on it just graduated, so we'll start a new PhD. You know, you learn things along the way, but we, we uh, come up with a problem we want to solve and then we try and develop a tool to do that, whether it's understanding chemistry or you know, light coming out of a, an object and so forth. I mean, one advantage, I, I have a very bad sense of direction. So a nice thing about the nanoscale is we make it so everything looks the same everywhere. So you can choose any part and sort of get the statistics you need. We don't have to find the star that does this or, huh. uh, and so we can find, you know, here's the, uh, you know, the arrangement we want to, to see many times repeated and then 
do the measurements and discover that they all behave differently and even individuals change over time. You know, so the fun comes at the end, but there's a lot of work that goes every day. To uh, I mean, it's, it's interesting being in the context where like, you guys will use tools that look like the tool that is required for the job, right? I, I have to encounter a lot where the tools are used to make art. Like I spend a lot of time in Home Depot and I spend all the things that you mm -hmm. make work, they, they, have a, um, they have a patina that they are not art, right? And you like, you, you, like, you conduct meaning from things into like something else, right? So like, like uh, in, my, in my space, you know, I have wall, white walls and the only conditions mm. of the work that I make there is that I need to leave, be able to leave the room. Right, it's like that is the only condition of the work to be made inside the studio that at mm -hmm. some point I have to get it through the door. And that's uh, like the only <laughs> scale that is important. <laughs> uh, so like all the things that happen there and all the potential of the buildings, materials that I use, you know, I use a lot of clay. I'm a photographer, but I use clay, I use wood, I use like mm. metal, and as you saw, like I use graphite, I use all the materials that they are made for other situations that are not necessarily art sometimes. So it's interesting thinking about like how the everything start like a, in art like in a more unfinished way, and uh, and and you surrendered yourself with like cultural gravitas or material uh, memory, things like that that will make mm. a work of art work like be performing mm. cult as a cultural object. Now I'm, I'm interested in that's like I mean thinking about low income housing or like. You know those like the, the have a house project in Chile, the, the, the Chilean architect that makes the, the houses after the earthquake, he gives like half house, right? So like, yeah, like Luis Arvena, yeah, right. So like, and it's like something that people can finish. You know, it's like something that like people can go and buy their own materials to customize the house. So you build it enough to make it cheap but sustainable. And then you can just like, as you make money, through your lifetime, you can like customize it and fix it. And it's a really interesting project if you should look because it's like, some of them are like an interesting piece of work, <laughs> you know, it's like, and, and, and when they are empty, they are like full of potential. So I like that uh, about this project that is like, it's a place where like, they have more potential than beauty. And that mm -hmm. is socially an interesting junction of art in some way. It's interesting to think about whether you can construct a work that's not finished. Yeah. And I think that's not been a long history in architecture where we think of it having to be somehow completed. But that project in particular was kind of brilliant in that uh, it expected it to keep changing and evolving and growing. Which is, you know, which is, is a comment touches on the, you know, this idea of a space of production or a, a project's reception, which I'm interested in everybody's case here. You all, you all other than this Tuesday evening, are speaking to audiences um, of a very different form than this one. And I, I was going to ask a question about um, what it means to come to an audience like this and speak about your work and your ideas about a question like space versus what that audience is like in your daily working lives or the public efforts that you make to explain that work to different kinds of audiences. Mm -hmm. Shall I? Yeah. So, well, there, I mean, there are very different groups we speak to. So there are times when it's uh, you know, clinicians trying to edit genes and we have some hmm. efforts we do there and it's a, that's a very you know, knowledgeable community on what they want to do and what their current problems are. There are other much more diverse groups where you know, it can be people who come from any field and lack hmm. you know, the uh, you know, chemical background where you know, straightforward explanations of here's what we're trying to do and why uh, matter. Here's, here's what we like. We do a fair amount of public uh, work too, trying to say you know, we're exploring this world where people haven't been before and it just opened up you know, in the last 30 years uh, to us, and there's still a tremendous amount we don't know, and we don't know what it feels like. Gravity doesn't matter. Capillary forces do. Uh, what are the other rules we don't understand yet? Uh, and that, just saying why we do what we do, ends up being really a part of the conversation. Well, I think astronomy is an interesting field because I often think of it as um, the gateway science. Uh, it's like the gateway drug. It's the beginning. <laughs> we live in a highly... Um, 
uh, technological society, and yet, um, unfortunately, we're also incredibly phobic of math and science. So I think astronomy and astrophysics has this um, societal role in, 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 in bringing the language of science and technology to the public. So as a result, you see a lot of astronomers who are incredibly committed to this public engagement piece. Yeah. Um, so I engage in a lot of this, um, yeah. not only because I think it's um, important, not only because I think in terms of understanding what a scientist looks like, but also because these telescopes are really expensive. <laughs> <laughs> um, and it's really important that we engage a lot of different audiences. And now, actually, yeah. there's another interesting issue coming back to your other question about space. We want to build this in Hawaii. Um, and now mm -hmm. there are communities in Hawaii that are no longer so excited about um, being viewed as a place of colonization. So also, astronomy has now taken on this other um, I'd call it, it's like a lightning um, uh, post. Uh, it's a big project that um, symbolizes this um, Western kind of taking over. Um, so all of a sudden, astronomers are being put in this position of, of, of talking about why it's good to make these investments in, in science. And, um, and as we use mm -hmm. these telescopes in different ways, we are becoming more removed, which is mm -hmm. removing mm -hmm. us spatially mm -hmm. from that community. So now all of a sudden, we're spending a lot of time thinking about how do we, can we get back into that space where the, actually the um, telescope is. So I, I guess I find myself um, increasingly, while I spend a lot of time obviously thinking about the technical and speaking uh, in a, you know, to, to, to scientists and, and uh, uh, technical people, this idea of public dissemination, public engagement, is increasingly important. Mm. I'm going to open it up to the to the audience in a couple of minutes' time. One other topic, though, that came up that I was really struck by across the, the spectrum of presentations is is a, a different notion of space than had been foregrounded in in the larger question, which is a space of collaboration and not just mm. production. I'm I'm really struck by the different ways that you gave us glimpses into very different ways of working. Mm -hmm. I mean, the the expertise that sits within your teams in the research mm -hmm. lab. Your work geographically across distances between tools and um, and yourself and, and collaborators back in the laboratory, um, the different constituencies across the city, and I'm I'm just I, I'm wondering if you if any of you would have comments on on the extent to which your thoughts around the building of that collaborative space is is in and of itself a kind of project within your work. Yeah. Well, there is no making architecture without a giant collaboration. I mean, we were talking about whether what precision is like from mm -hmm. nanoscale to architectural scale. And I think I might make the case that the precision in architecture is absolutely dependent on the collaboration. Precision meaning that you'd like to implement the thing that you're trying to create. <laughs> and that that thing you're trying to create I mean, my first book was about that being a negotiation, not something that yeah. comes from the fountainhead of some individual mm -hmm. creator. And I think that we don't think about that space of collaboration as creative pra pra practices enough. And in my experience, really, that's kind of what I've been most interestingly involved with, is how you make something mm -hmm. that's really good and important with a, you know, army or mm -hmm. crowd of actors. Yeah, thank you. I kind of envy Rodrigo's <laughs> ability to ma manipulate a room even, although I think your audience is something you're constructing all the time as a bigger collaboration, but. Yeah, I mean, there is a generosity that had to happen to like, you know, like as a, I mean, I don't know how it's in you guys' discipline, but I, I rely on the students to or my assistants on time or my or people to like finish the thought too, right? Like you present mm. the possibilities and ideas and, and there is the, there is so much I can teach students in art that they are like it's not already inside them, right? Like it's not within them their capacities. You know, yeah. I can tell you of, um, you know, so you have to instigate that curiosity for them to figure out what is their space. But like and the same with like when I go to these museums, I can't, you know, I can't even touch anything, right? There's a registrar, <laughs> there's a person. So you have to trust that like also everybody else want you to also execute this criticality I have about the spaces 
onto themselves, mm. you know? So you have to first like figure out how do you wanna like convince them that being critical of the space where yeah. they work is gonna be good without getting fired. So <laughs> like, it's just like, it's just a skill of finesse and talking about the ideas and how to like contextualize them correctly. Um, and, uh, and that is, uh, that require a lot of like communication skill. Mm. And like a lot of the time just like, just like let people throw your ideas to you and you're gonna respond more than like, mm. like lecture and let people. Yeah, mm -hmm. terrific. Mm -hmm. terrific. Yeah, that actually is where nanoscience came from. We didn't have a field, so we brought in people from chemistry, physics, math, engineering, medicine, and said, you know, what problems do you care about that you can't solve? Hmm. And then what approaches do you take? And what tools do you have? And what do you need? And so the field developed by teaching each other language skills and then between the discipline absolutely between, yeah. yeah between then oh. uh, experimental and theory skills and you know, math we actually share not only the same math but the same mathematicians on our you know on our projects oh. uh, but that's also led us out of the nanoscale so the brain initiative came from nanoscientists proposing it because we were curious about how the brain worked and then you know microbiome initiative also not really nano but we thought well, there are a lot of missing tools for how bugs talk to each other in our mouths, on our skin, you know, in the ocean, in the mm -hmm. soil. And so it really developed from collecting a group of people who had the language skills and then experts who had the refractory problems to tackle. And it's been really the, the uh, uh, impact of the field beyond, you know, mm -hmm. making little things and moving atoms around and trying to understand how motors worked. At, in biology. And clearly a capacity for translation between forms of knowledge or disciplines. It's, it's sort of interesting part of it. allow communication. Yeah. And it hasn't happened in other fields that we can tell, which we don't yep. understand. Uh, but it's, Terrific. it's part I think, of fun. I, yeah. I think I'm getting a signal that we can, we have a couple of microphones in the room, mm -hmm. and we really want this to be an important part of each of the sessions. We can open it up to some questions. For the next several minutes, I don't know where the microphones are. There we go, and I see some hands coming up. Thank you guys so much for the talk. Um, what do you think spirituality's re relationship to space is? Well, I, um, I'll take that one. <laughs> um, so there's, uh, it turns out astronomers are actually some of the most um, uh, religious, spiritual of the, of the science, uh, scientists. Uh, and there's, in fact, there's an interesting foundation called the Templeton Foundation that supports work at the interface between science and religion. Um, I think um, it's interesting to, to really, I think, I think it's uh, I think the comment I made about the humbling piece, that there's, you, you definitely get the sense of something bigger. It's so much bigger than we are, both in terms of spa uh, space and time. Mm -hmm. uh, it, it can't but leave you with that sense of um, something bigger. I saw it on this side over here. Uh, I'd like to address this both to Professor Cuff and uh, Rodrigo. Uh, you talked a lot about, you didn't say the words exactly, but transformation, uh, reutilization, appropriation, maybe those aren't the right words, reclamation. Um, and the whole concept starting, well, Hausman, Corbu, uh, Bunker Hill, et cetera, the freeways taking over and so on and mm. so forth, and down to this concept that you brought forth, which is the backyard home, which is a space that was never used for, well, it was used for a garage to hold the car. But the fact that it's, it was brought up a long time ago, but hasn't advanced very much, has it? This whole concept of reusing re space uh, that you brought up. This, that, that we need all over the world, basically, but especially here uh, in LA. I'm not sure if I quite understand what you mean by advanced very much, but I think the answer is no, <laughs> it hasn't advanced very much. Um, and in fact, we learned about, I mean, anyone can learn about that space's reclamation from watching what had been going on in backyards for the last oh. 200 years, right? We learned it from bottom-up practices, from vernacular practices. You know, there's really wonderful books and studies about how people in 
Bell Gardens and other parts of the sort of blue collar life of Los Angeles have always used their residential space as an income generating part of their household economy. So. Cal with the number, I don't know what that is. Wasn't that some special ordinance that just. Yes, yes, that's the uh, state bill that we co authored to make legal all these secondary units. Mm -hmm. Because they weren't legal before. That's yeah. right. So they were all illegal. And now we're trying to figure out how to legalize the ones that are already in existence. I'm sorry I didn't make that clear. There you go. Yeah. Over here. <clears throat> yeah, again, thank you very much for a very, very great discussion. I was wondering, we talk about objects in space and, and uh, on the micro level and the macro level and about building in space and defining space. I was wondering if you wanted to talk about the other part of it, which is the space itself, which is the part that you're, that you're impinging on or the objects exist in, um, which is also the name of the, the, the committee itself, space, I mean, this focus of this. It is the other element, the, the one we haven't talked about. I mean, I think that it's gonna, because the spaces are so predetermined by these ideas that come from the ontology of the world or the depending of what you are trying to denominate as a space, right? Like, as somebody was asking about the spirituality, there is often a space where that happens, right? There is like, you go to a place that have walls and they have like a ceiling where that spirituality happened. And that is already charged with a political history and a specific kind of like traditions. So in some way you enter, um, there, is, there is almost any space, like any, like the Rodko Chapel at, in Houston, right? It's like full of paintings, right? Mm -hmm. and, and you can enter and, and I think, uh, and I don't know who profits more of, uh, of, the, of the feeling of spirituality. Maybe the, uh, the artists get charged with something that necessarily is not intrinsic to purple paint, right? So like, it's like the, 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 just the brushes don't have a spirit, don't have God on them. Right? Like they have, like, the artist definitely is not touched by any like, um, like mystery force. So like, um, so it's interesting when like the space is already charged before you even consider them what is gonna happen there. Like there is a certain amount of activities that can happen. And in some way, when I make movies like that, when in most of my movies, I try to build a space where actions can happen rather than predetermine the actors to do it because people will, na will naturally respond to spaces. Like everybody in the elevator have elevator face, right? Like, like you have elevator <laughs> conversations and you have elevated <laughs> attitude, you know? So like this, like this, you like that's a space that any, you know, there is no such a thing as a small talk in the middle of the desert. You run into anyone in the desert and suddenly things become more, prof more profound. When do you have like a convert, and any random comment that some stranger will tell you if you encounter them in the middle of the desert, I don't know why you're gonna get closer to that guy, but <laughs> it, will be, it will be like, holy fuck, that means something. And then you want to walk around thinking, uh, trying to search for the meaning of that one line that some, you know, wandering guy give you. So the spaces are like, even if it doesn't have walls, are predetermined, um, and you are you come conditioned to like, you know, find either a spirituality or like, or, you know, social or cultural context. I think it's already when when we say the word, they already charge. Mm. So. Um, I have a microphone, <laughs> so thank you very much for uh, presenting your ideas at all this, uh, these different scales. And my question was related to the question that just happened about what's going on inside the spaces. And so maybe we can expand to hearing from uh, the other speakers um, about how space how space affects the things inside the spaces and motion and direction and orientation and yeah, movement. We're in a place where there's performances sometimes. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. 
Andrea, one of your points that was, was really memorable is this idea that you get a glimpse into a universe in motion. And that, that isn't just a motion in a room this scale, but in <laughs> fact... Well, yeah, you can take this to the extreme. The whole universe is in motion. The idea that we started uh, from a point and there was a big bang that, that set the, the universe in motion. Yeah. I'll also leave you with the thought of um, the fact that most of space is empty is actually nothing. Uh, so while we give tremendous value to these objects, most of space is empty. Also, I'll give a motion to go. So, uh, one of our inspirations is in nature. There are motors that can take chemical energy and convert it into motion with better than 99% efficiency. And there's nothing humans make at any scale that comes close to that. And so, one of the goals in my lab is to build structures where we know where every atom is. We go from quantum mechanics to mechanical engineering and experiment theory and simulation. And we figure out what are the key components of that ability to move. So that's why we have these you know, smaller switches and motors, and we can operate them. When we had to build microscopes, you look at their function at the same time they look at the structure, at the same time that they do other measurements. And you alluded to something in your question about what's going on underneath the surface. That turns out to be a hard thing for us to measure, but a goal for many, many years. And so we developed a whole series of tools to do that, and we discovered this sort of buried network that affects properties very greatly. Uh, there are pieces that line up, pieces that move, uh, and we've come up with ways to detect those, and that adds an additional level of both you know, interesting observations, but also ways to control and to, uh, you know, to make structures that we wouldn't be able to do just by you know, putting two pieces uh, right next to each other. So it turns out to be a, a whole, uh, you know, like uncovering a, an, an ant colony or something. We, we've mm -hmm. learned a lot about what's going on underneath and the dynamics and the structures that form and not, again, not intuitive based on the macroscopic world around us. Thank you. And, and Rodrigo has spoken on the topic. Dana, you, you mentioned in your presentation the idea, this very modern, late modern idea of the city in motion. The freeway becomes a part of our discourse and thinking about the city. But it's clearly a very different kind of motion than might exist at, at either a chemical or a physical universal scale. Yes, but I, I think architecture is really about the intimacy between the life within and the thing that houses it. I mean, really, that mm -hmm. is the art form uh, which doesn't exist without the life within it, whether that's something you want to describe as uh, in motion or process, maybe that's not quite adequate to think about the robust nature of our inhabitation. But um, for certain, the you know that space. I think that's one of the things that you know is interesting in looking at the history of the notion of space. Is really it's a history about the notion of the life within the walls that we construct. So. Wonderful. We have a couple of minutes left. A couple of more urgent questions. Up here on the left, we have one. Um, I found the uh, whole concept of this, you know, the, t the 10 questions fascinating because you picked words that distill, just like in the, you know, if you wanted to pick the smallest particle in existence, uh, in many ways, words are sometimes the smallest particles of existence, as long as you pick the right words. And I think you guys have done a pretty good job picking these words. So my question is to the panelists, when you heard this word first, space, did you have one idea in mind, one definition of that word, or many? And how did you go about picking the, you know, the, the anchor that you were going to you know, <laughs> latch yourself onto for this discussion? Thank you. That's terrific. I, I definitely send right away this idea of like no, no enough space. I always think in maybe <laughs> negative terms, but you know, I, I thinking, I mean, seeing the roster and con considering that, like, the, there was uh, people that think about the space in a very, in a very like, uh, big way and the, the, the poetic connotations of a space, um, and thinking about people is so attached to time, like, but where my brain goes right away is like, it's almost think closer to uh, Dana's like uh, research where, um, where like there is a time and a space that happen when you are poor, right? There is like, poor people get punished with time, longer commutes, 
you know, like <laughs> more distance. Uh, like you could make even within the panel or the edge and the, the kind of course, like how far do we live from work? And you can see like the social economic strategy will be miles more from like where is, is you know, so like, uh, so there is like a time and a space is conditioning in a non poetic way to like how we uh, cohabitate society. Mm -hmm. And it's, it's, to me, it's, it was the first when you think about the space and I think, like, oof, no enough. <laughs> no enough space. Okay, that's not enough. This is a great question. First thing you thought of, uh, Andrea, you, you get the invitation from space. us, what is space? Um, well, beyond thinking that's what I do, uh, I guess. <laughs> this is great. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I guess I thought it would be interesting to talk about the, um, the our, our reference, our, our position in space, our understanding of ourself with respect to the space, so that understanding of not Earth-centric, not solar-centric, just this increasingly, increasingly large scale that we actually have the ability to comprehend as humans. So uh, for me, it was trying to convey getting to that unexplored world. And uh, yeah, I'll, I'll throw in one thing, and that is astronomy was my gateway drug to, <laughs> to science Excellent. until I was eight years old, and my brother blew things up in the driveway. And then I thought, well, there must be something interesting in chemistry, too. <laughs> so. I think I kind of panicked because, like Andrea, yeah. I think uh, that's what I do. Like, I'm going to explain in 10 minutes the whole of architecture. How would I do that? And then I um, was like, uh, it, I went into research mode. You know, I started reading about Einstein, and then I started like reading the newspaper and thinking about you know Silicon Valley. You know, people say, uh, yeah, no, I'm going to develop that space. It's like. How come everybody's got space? I thought that was ours in architecture. <laughs> <laughs> so. And they call themselves information architects. Yes, I it's hate It's even that. more. And they're designers, and they're really advertisers. <laughs> you know, the whole thing is just a subterfuge. <laughs> Thank you. Well, one more question I think we've got time Ooh. for. Um, down here, please, up, uh, down front. We've got a couple. Yeah. All right, we'll try and squeeze in a couple of more questions here. Uh, thank you very much. Um, Professor Cuff, I was really struck by your use of the phrase lost space, and I was, um, I was curious maybe to hear, um, maybe hear from the other three speakers if they have a thought about what lost space means mm -hmm. to them. Yeah, I'm gonna try to be really short. I, I think like let's, um, since we're in a, in a university, let's think very, um, I mean, I work in a great institution and most of the institutions have a diversity mandate, right? So like if I apply to a job or if I try to like go to a place where, you know, maybe the, they, uh, there's a limit for the space of like, of um, minorities, right? There's a, there is a limit for a space for any kind. Like even if mm. you have too many white dudes, they're gonna be a limit right now. So like, it's like, it's, so when you think about institutions or like uh, mandates about like, the limits of that, uh, it may be that like, there is already one. Lat if it was another Latino photo professor, uh, there is no chance I can get a job, right? There's no chance I can get a job. So like, there is like, th that is the limit. Uh, there is like a limit of like realization, what are the limits that the institutions have self-imposed and the spaces have self-imposed, right? So like, museums have a, collect have a collection, the collection have necessities to complete itself Right, like um, galleries have a roster. There is enough artists of one kind, or not enough of another kind. So you have there is always a limit, and I think that is how you can understand a lot of the the rooms where you enter. What is the limit? So of the lost room? space, limited space. One of the oh. points you made, Paul, at the very beginning, that was interesting is this idea that you, and I believe it was when you were showing the Moybridge uh, animation, this idea that you you occasionally get glimpses of space. Mm -hmm. and that there's a kind of active interpretation. Mm. Yeah, yeah. Well, I mean, we try in that, uh, we try and cover, it's about a factor of 100 billion in time uh, without really being able to do that. So we have to come up with clever ways either to fill in or take snapshots mm. or something else. I'll may, maybe go back to your original comment on the campus, though. So one of the very great advantages here is we are at very high density and mm. we do have the arts and science and engineering and medicine all 
proximate. And that's a very unusual uh, aspect of the university, and particularly of the quality of the people we have across all different areas. So I feel like I've hit a lot of the sciences and engineering and a piece of medicine. I have a few tentacles up here, but I do feel like I'm missing. Uh, you know, a, I have a lot to learn, as I mentioned, with a filmmaker at the end and some other collaborations in that space, if you don't mind me. <laughs> yeah. Just uh, what I was you know, they're, about. they're, yeah, I know, sorry. <laughs> you put it in my head, I'm stuck. <laughs> but, you know, I, I, I think we do, we, we have a lot to teach each other. Um, and part of it is, you know, storytelling and, and where we come from and why and how we think about space. And I think you chose very uncharacteristic. I mean, we all look at space in a different way than I think most of the people in our fields do. That became clear. Uh, so unrepresentative in some sense is good, it expands everything, but I think we have this opportunity here at UCLA to, to reach out to each other and do things that nobody else can. We found that in our technical work, but there's, there's much more to it than that uh, yet to come, I think. I guess when I hear this question, I think about um, the windows that we have into space, that we're highly mm. biased by our historical mm. ability to get optical, um, what your eye detects. That's where the first instruments were developed. Um, but there are other windows to different um, kinds of light. So what UCLA is good at, really good at is the detection of infrared light. That's, that's what uh, we specialize in. But there are, there are other windows, X-ray, gamma rays, and that's all focused on light. And now we're even opening up the concept that you can detect um, gravitational waves. So there are these different, you could, uh, coming back to this concept of diversity, one needs a diversity of, of information to, to paint the full picture. Otherwise, you have a very biased view on, on um, our understanding of the universe. Terrific, thank you. And I'm gonna use that last round of four responses to draw a close to this. We've, we've come to the, the end of the evening. Thank you, uh, the, the four of you, thank you so much for being on this side of the fourth <laughs> wall. For all of you for coming in and spending part of your week with all of us. Thank you so much, everybody. Thank you. Um, and parts of this evening's conversation touched upon next Tuesday evening, which of course will be what is time? Please come in and join us for that one. Thank you, everybody. <laughs>